evening. Welcome to Cozy Talks Live. All right, we had a huge week last week with uh, Integrum was in the house. Uh, we were talking about their Oprah implant system and how they use osteointegration uh, for above the knee amputees here in the U.S. to provide a way to use a prosthesis without having to use a socket at all. Um, that was a really jam-packed show. We had so much information going on there. Um, I'm still kind of reeling from that one. And the feedback was just amazing, guys. So I really appreciate all the support uh, from that last Wednesday's show. I'm getting my notes ready here. Hey there, Harsh. Harsh, I think like you're the first person that comes on my show like every single week. I love it. And I love the fact that you're here. You've been with me now for several years now. Uh, watching the show. So thank you again, Harsh, for all of your support doing this. Hey, Joan. Oh my goodness, Joan. I have you written on my calendar and you and I need to catch up and I am not going to forget that. So, so good to see you, Joan. I'm so glad to see you here this evening. Guys, for those of you watching the replay, uh, thank you so much again for all the support that you show me in the during the live show and for the replay as well. Uh, go ahead and put replay in the comments section. I do like to go back to see uh, the comments. And if you have any questions that you want me to answer, put them in the replay. And I do go back and I read through and I answer those questions. Howdy, Paul. Adult beverages are in order. I would agree, except for it's a school night for me. So I'm, I'm here with my uh, my diet Pepsi. I know it's real, real exciting. Hope yours is more interesting, Paul. All right, guys. So we've got a uh, much more quiet show this evening, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm always, I always love these kind of shows after we've had a really big sponsored show uh, the week prior. Um, we've got Stephen on board, made it this week, Jackson Bell in the hizzy. So thanks for being there, Stephen. Hey there, Rich from Mission, Texas with French Roast. Nice, nice. All right, guys, I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes to jump on board this evening. I uh, had a few questions that came in. Uh, some of them related to last week's show on osteointegration, um, but we do have room for more questions this evening. So please feel free to throw those into the comments section. Uh, and then once again, guys, I am also broadcasting to my YouTube channel. So I know some folks have a little bit of hard time finding me on Facebook. Uh, so I always like to say that I do broadcast to YouTube, Cozy Talks. Uh, let's see, Harsh is saying flying to Florida next week. You're going to be in my backyard, Harsh. All right. We've got Denise on board, Sprite Zero with her. And we've got Felicia up in Georgia. Thank you for joining us this evening, guys. Okay. Again, I'm going to give you guys about one more minute to get everybody on board because I know I'm expecting a few, few newcomers this evening. So I want to give them a chance to be able to find uh, where the show is. Anybody receive the email text or the text reminder this evening? Show of hands. Who got the text this evening to show that I was and if the links were working? I'm still kind of trialing out this new texting service. Hey, Pastor David, good to be here. Good to see you, man. I'm so glad you're here. All right, guys. Marianne, hello. And yes, you got, yes. Okay, good. You got the email, Richard. Yes. Okay. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much again. And I do want to take the time to say thank you to all of you guys who showed up for last week's live show with Integrum. Uh, love seeing that support. Love seeing your curiosity and all the questions that you had. You guys had some great questions. Many of you emailed me after the show with more questions, which... I love it when you do that because it shows that you're really interested in the topic I picked. So thank you again. Okay, Joan got it. Hey, Kay, got the text up in Alaska. It's good to see you back, Kay. You've been globetrotting, globetrotting for quite a while. All right, guys, ready? Hmm. We're going to get the show started. So for those of you who are joining me for the first time this evening, welcome. My name is Kosi Belloso. I'm a physical therapist amputee specialist here in sunny central Tampa, Florida. Uh, I've been a PT now for a little over 20 years. 20 years. Paul, how old does that make you then? <laughs> uh, and I have an outpatient amputee practice here in Tampa called Palanca, and it is exclusively to serve the amputee and limb loss community. So, hey, Tom, glad you could make it. Andrea got the text. Andrea is my resident occupational therapist who shows up every week. And I'm so glad she does because when I have an OT related question, she is there for me. So guys, last week, as I mentioned, we had a big show uh, on Integrum and the Oprah implant system. So for those of you who weren't there, first of all, shame on you. It was a great show. Um, but that's why God reinvented the, invented the replay. You can go back to my YouTube channel and watch the show again. It's about how they use osseointegration, the technique, the surgical technique of osseointegration um, to allow an above the knee amputee to use a prosthesis without having to use a socket. So 
lots of information in that show. We have a couple of follow-up questions here from that show. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with one of those questions. Ooh, before I do, actually, we're going to wait just a little bit for that. So here is a question that came in from Steven. Steven asks, can you wait train after surgery? And do you need an assistant? I leave I live by myself and I don't have anyone to care for me. Does Medicare pay for the equipment and the surgery? Hey, comadre, water for you there. That's all right. We'll get you some. Uh, what was that drink that you like to drink? I forgot. Boy, I'm having a, a mommy moment right there. Mom brain moment. Hey, Tom, glad you could join in. So anyways, as far as weight training after the surgery, after you have osteointegration. Um, so for those of you who were uh, present last week, you learned that with osteointegration, they insert um, a fixture into the femur, right? And with that, they attach as a three-part system, right? And it uh, exits the body right out the side of the, uh, the residual limb, and that's where the prosthesis is connected, right? So it is a two-part surgical procedure process, and there is a recovery time, obviously, in between each of those procedures, okay? And a lot of physical therapy involved. And we're going to be getting more into the physical therapy side of things in the show in May. I believe it's May 3rd is when we have that their next show, okay? So after all of the healing is done, um, the individual, you know, leads a very full life. Um, we're seeing folks with osteointegration uh, with the Oprah implant system. And again, I'm speaking on behalf of the Oprah implant system. I'm not quite as familiar with the Prestfit system, but with the Oprah implant, you know, folks are going into the pool. Folks are going on hikes. Folks are going uh, everywhere, right? So with the exception of high impact activity, that's probably one of the limitations of the OI procedure. As far as weight training is concerned, that that's a really big range. You know, weight training can be something as simple as using your own body weight. And for that, yes, of course, you can do that after, after osteointegration. In fact, you do that a lot in the recovery and the rehab process. As far as what is the weight limit, you know, that you can put on the osteointegration, that is actually a really great question. And I'm going to actually go back to Integrum to ask them that. Um, and I know they're going to have a good answer for me because many of their osteointegration, their first osteointegration patients here in the United States um, were through Walter Reed, our military servicemen. Um, and a lot of those men and women are extremely active in their lives. So I know that they've put uh, the osteointegration through the test. So I will be back next week, I promise with an answer about that. Hey there, Johnny V from Poughkeepsie, New York in the Cozy Talks house. Hey there, Pat, so glad you could join in this evening. All right, as far as the question, do you need assistance after surgery? So the question would be, yes, it's, it's you can expect to require the same amount of assistance that you would need for any of your other surgeries. So for example, the amount of assistance that you needed after your first amputation surgery. You know, it's kind of tough to gauge sometimes, but, you know, you do need is it is a major surgery, right? So you will need some probably some form of assistance. Now, if you were someone that after your initial amputation, you were on the ball with the physical therapy, your early mobility, you got up and moving, chances are with the osteointegration, you will also be able to kind of bounce back with that, hopefully that same um, progression, okay? Um, but everybody kind of knows their own body, right? So you can use your initial surgery to kind of gauge, okay, that might be more or less the amount of assistance I might need after osteointegration. Now, I will say this, with the Oprah system, right? they make sure, right, that the surgeons have the right support staff on hand, meaning that they have the PT and OT services on hand, right? So all of this is done in the pre-planning stages before the surgery is even done. Where is it that you're going to go after surgery? Are you expected to need a, an inpatient rehab stay? right, to get strong, especially for those of you who do live by yourselves, right, to make sure that you are completely independent before you go home, okay? So these are really good questions to ask, Stephen, and if this is something that you are considering, this is a very valid point to bring up to the surgeon, you know, and saying, I live by myself. How are we going to accommodate for this? And I can tell you this, guys, in the years that I've been working as a physical therapist, that was that was a lot of what we had to plan for with our post-op patients. Um, and when I worked in the hospital system and I was, you know, as a physical therapist, we were in charge of helping with discharge planning. You know, we had to plan for all of these things for our patients, regardless of if, whether they had a surgery or if they were there for an illness or for whatever it was. We had to determine, are they safe enough to go home? And what does home look like? Do they have the support and the services that they will need? And if not, how can we get that for them? 
Yes. And again, guys, this isn't just particular to osteo integration or a major surgery like that. This should be for those of you who are having a revision. Okay. Those of you who are perhaps facing that initial amputation and you're watching the show, just trying to see what it is that you need to learn about. Okay. That post-op planning. So, so, so important. So important to have that support. Hey there, Eric. Glad you could join in. Eric's watching me from the YouTube channel. All right, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and type this number in. Okay. And yes, it's totally a shameless plug. Lately, I've been using a texting service and I promise I don't spam your phone. I don't sell your information. None of that baloney. Right. So if you text COSI Talks in all caps to that number that I just listed there, you will be signed up for my texting service. Okay. And basically what I do is on Wednesday evenings, before I go live, I send just a reminder text and I put the links in there to make it easy to find the show. So that's pretty much what I use it for. Okay. So we've got Nancy. Hey, Nancy, glad you could join in. All right, guys, so let's move on to another question we have here. And guys, by the way, those of you who are newcomers this evening, don't be shy. Feel free to put your questions in the comments section. That's what the show is for. That's what I'm here to do. So to help answer your questions. So go ahead and put any questions that you might have in there. Uh, this person uh, was from one of the support groups. This is a question I grabbed from there. It says, I am a left uh, above the knee amputee. Uh, my leg is being casted now. I'm in a wheelchair. What are some things I should ask and understand before I make this appointment to speak to their one hour, one time personal trainer? I would be doing this by myself, meaning if I was to fall, I'd have to find a way to get myself back up again. Do they consider us a liability? So this is a really big question. And this is something that I run into um, a lot uh, with my patients in terms of, you know, how do I get back to the community? How do I get back to my fitness level? Right. Typing in one of my resources here. Bear with me for a moment. Okay. So first of all, if you're just being casted for your prosthesis, that means that this is your first time using a prosthesis. The person you should be kind of looking for is not the personal trainer. The first person you should be looking for is the physical therapist. Okay. The personal trainer is not a clinician. They are not a trained clinician. Pretty simple, right? The physical therapist is the trained clinician who is going to be able to evaluate, okay, you basically from head to toe to determine what it is that you have, what impairments you might have to facilitate helping you use that prosthesis, okay? And a lot of folks still, I still run into a lot of folks and it makes me go, oh my goodness, who are not aware of physical therapists and the services that they offer to an amputee, both before, during, and after amputation, okay? So during the process of learning to use your prosthesis, really, really important that you find a physical therapist. And we're starting to see them more, guys. I know there's not a whole lot of us out there who specialize in working with amputees, but you are starting to see more of them pop up, okay? And to be quite honest with you, if I had to have a choice between a physical therapist who's never worked with an amputee and a personal trainer who's never worked with an amputee, I would always choose the physical therapist. Again, they are clinicians, right? And there's a lot of physical therapists out there. They all, all physical therapists will have the baseline training for gait training. That is the bread and butter of our profession, right? That is what we are tested for in our licensing, right? We know how to do gait training on folks, right? Different types of gait training, okay? So a lot of times what you need to do is find that physical therapist who would, does want to help you, introduce them to your prosthetist and let them develop a plan of care for you all together, okay? So when I hear someone who's looking for a personal trainer, the first thing I wanna ask is, have you already been seen by the physical therapist and treated, okay? Um, I've had on several occasions where patients that I see in my own clinic here in Tampa that we finish the, my patient's goals, right? They're independent in the community, they're doing a lot of the things they wanna do, and they would like to be able to continue to build on their fitness and just develop a lifelong fitness habit, which I am all for. And there's a couple of different options for folks who work with me. A lot of my patients travel quite a bit of distance to come see me, sometimes one to two hours driving. So for me to continue doing their fitness program sometimes isn't realistic, right? So I will, you know, they will find a personal trainer in their area 
and I will meet with that personal trainer, whether it's a phone call or a Zoom video meeting, and we'll talk about what are the things that my patient needs to do to stay strong and healthy and be safe, especially with the prosthesis. And I've had some wonderful success stories with personal trainers who were very open um, to talking with me and meeting with me so that we could discuss this kind of plan of care. So for those of you who are out there who are just like, I want to actually go to the gym. I like being in a gym and using gym equipment to get strong and just kind of like that whole environment and vibe, that's a really great way to start going about doing it. Find that personal trainer who's willing to talk to your physical therapist. And that's also kind of another red flag. If you have a personal trainer who doesn't want to talk to your physical therapist, probably not the personal trainer you want to sign up with. Okay. Because there are things that can crop up while you're using your prosthesis in the gym, um, small injuries that may or may not occur. And these are things that your physical therapist needs to help with and be in communication. Does that make sense, guys? Another resource, which I'm going to be shameless and plug it. Uh, those of you who are interested in lifelong fitness program, the strong body program that I designed is that it's 150 video exercises for above the knee and below the knee amputees covers head to toe fitness. And there are books to go along with it with full color, full description, lots of education here. So I've had some patients who take these books and this program to their personal trainers and their personal trainers can open it and see, oh, this is how we can adapt these exercises to meet your needs with your prosthesis. Make sense? All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Stephen, I forgot to answer this last part of your question. Does Medicare pay for the equipment and the surgery for osteointegration surgery? Yes. Medicare has been paying for the Oprah system. I don't know about the PressFit system, so I can't speak on that one, guys. But I do know Medicare has been, um, and insurance companies, not just Medicare, other insurance companies have been paying for this procedure. It is currently the only FDA PMA approved um, device to be used for osteointegration for above the knee amputees in the United States, in the United States, yeah. All right, I see some comments that have rolled in. So let me see if I can grab these comments. Mm. Oh, Stephen says, I was in so much pain one night after my revision that I could get to the door to open it for the paramedics. And again, Stephen, especially if you've already had that kind of an experience before, and, and, and it kind of breaks my heart because I've heard it time and time again, where people were either sent home too soon from the hospital or they were sent home without the right resources. And it can be it can be awful. It can be a disaster. I'm not going to lie. So Stephen, this is something that you need to put this on the surgeon, right? The surgeon's the one who kind of kickstarts that procedure. The surgeon usually then refers it to their nurse practitioner or to their social worker case manager. And they are the ones in charge of putting all of this together, right? And the physical therapist and occupational therapists are the ones in charge of evaluating you to see, okay, this is where this person is at right now after surgery, and this is where they have the potential to progress. But until they get to that point, right, we need to provide them with services, whether it's an inpatient rehab stay, right, where you go and you stay um, for a week or two or three weeks, depending on the, the, the severity, um, to work just on your mobility, or if they send you home with home health services, okay? But definitely, this is where I tell folks, definitely squeak the wheel, okay? Don't be shy about speaking up and saying, hey, I live by myself. I don't have any family that lives nearby me or all of my family is working full time. They can't be there during the daytime to help me. Right. Um, telling your surgeon and your team about the details of your home. OK, so whenever I'm doing my intake form for any of my patients, regardless of what setting, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, home health, wherever I was, I would always make a note of what is what does my patient's home look like? Do they live in a one-story home? Do they live in an apartment on the second floor without an elevator? Do they live in a trailer home that has three narrow steps to get inside and no railing? Do they have access to their bathroom? Okay, so these are all things that PTs and OTs, right, are going to evaluate to determine if the person is ready or not to go home safely. OK, and these are all things, guys, like I said, whether you're having a revision, whether you're having osteointegration, whether you're looking at your very first amputation right now, these are all things that you need to be communicating with your team. Hey there, Alex from Lake Norman. Oh, it's good to see you, man. Oh, thank you, Joan. I appreciate that. All right. Let me see. 
Okay. And just to kind of piggyback on this, the last question I did that was just asked about the gym and personal trainers. And the person also said, I would be myself, meaning that if I was to fall, I'd have to find a way to get myself back up. Okay. So this is where I'm going to again, plug the physical therapist in there. Part of what we are supposed to be teaching you is how to get up off the floor. That is a crazy important skill to learn because at some point in your life as an amputee, at some point, you're going to have a fall. Okay. It makes my heart rate up to go see that and to say that, but it's, it's the reality of it, right? Let's just do a quick cozy poll. I haven't done a cozy poll in quite some time. Those of you who are out there who have been using a prosthesis, uh, how many times have you fallen? Go ahead. Let's, let's put it in the comment section. How many times have you fallen? Whether it's just, just in your lifetime as an amputee, or maybe just even in the past year as an amputee, how many times have you fallen down? Okay. And we're starting to see more uh, videos about this online, which I love. So just recently I was watching this, this lovely physical therapist. She's up North. Her name is Michelle. And she posted a video of how she teaches her above the knee patients, how to get up off the floor and into their wheelchair. The, this particular one was a bilateral above the knee amputee patient, right? So it was a really great way because, you know, there's different techniques for doing this a case like this year or total at least 10. Uh, let's see, Jean says two, Alex says two or three, Stephen five or eight times in five years. Uh, Jeannie says once in six years. Not bad, Jeannie. Uh, Denise says zero yet, probably overtly cautious. I'm knocking on some wood there for you, Denise. Uh, Patricia says one in two years, but I am psychotically careful. <laughs> That's a great description there, Patricia. Marianne says, Michael would not help me learn to get up. I've fallen five times. Oh, Marianne. Marianne, please send me an email and I'm going to try to find that video of the bilateral AK um, moving up into the wheelchair because it was really beautifully done. And I think that's something that you might be able to work on with Michael. Uh, Charlie says, tuck and roll, baby, 12 times. <laughs> Cut above. Felicia says, I've been lucky. No falls yet as an amputee in two years. Johnny B says, I tried, not sure I try to forget those statistics. <laughs> and, and guys, it's not saying that I'm encouraging you to fall by no means. And for those of you who haven't fallen, bravo to you. Um, but you know, even folks with two anatomical legs fall. Just the other day I was, I was running down the sidewalk and there was an invisible crack on the sidewalk that jumped out and, and barked at me. I, I swear it happened that way. And I was just head over heels right on the sidewalk. Okay. It's going to happen. The point is you need to know how to get up, whether it's because you know how to instruct someone on how to help you if you're physically not able to do it yourself or you have the potential to do it yourself and you've got to figure out the strategy and the technique for it. Okay. So yes, in situations like when you're in a gym, you're going to be at a higher risk for falling. Why? Because there's stuff everywhere, right? There is gym equipment. There are weights, there are people's towels and water bottles and then people and body parts lying around all over the place. Right. Um, so, you know, yes. And as far as liability is concerned, you know, I've never heard of an amputee who was turned away from a gym because of liability. I mean, they have you sign all those waivers and that's what that is for. Another thing I want to kind of plug in there for you, since we're talking about gyms, that's another part where the physical therapist can help out. Okay. I've taken some of my patients to the gym sometimes where they said, I go to this gym and I said, okay, for our next session, I'm going to meet you at your gym. And we're going to go through the equipment and we're going to go through the machines that are appropriate for you and show you how to use them, show you how you can accommodate with your prosthesis, maybe taking off your prosthesis for some of them, right? And how you can safely maneuver around the gym. That is part of what physical therapists do, okay? And then the cool thing is, is if you're at the gym and the personal trainer's there, you can have that session together right? So there's lots of ways, guys, that you can get back into the gym, that you can get back to working out and doing some of these activities. Me personally, I like to do my workouts in my own garage. That's probably why I came up with this program in the first place, because that's just what fits and works for my lifestyle. But I do understand that there's some of you out there that, you know, you used to go to the gym or that's something that you'd like to be able to start doing again. And you should, you should being safe. <laughs> okay. Tom says I've fallen too many times to count. I have a farm and I get myself in some crazy situations. Yep. I hear you. Susan says I'm very clumsy <laughs> and there's Jill in Berkeley with her ice water. Um, so there we go. All right. Let's see what we got here. Okay. This question is a really cool one. So this uh, lovely young lady sent me this, this question and it's a kind of a longer question, but 
We're going to answer it little by little. It says, I mentioned swimming in my previous email, which I love more than anything, but I don't know how to swim with my residual lid. And I've tried to hire someone to teach me. I haven't been able to find anyone that acknowledges that they've taught amputees. And then there's the cost. Everything is so expensive. And when you're living on disability, you have to watch every penny. Girlfriend, I hear you. Okay. Um, and especially with inflation and everything going on nowadays, whew, everybody's washing their pennies and I don't blame you. Okay. When it comes to swimming, I am a huge fan. In fact, today I had a wonderful, wonderful interview with Amplitude Magazine. They're going to be doing a special. Um, I should probably not be saying everything about that, right? Am I giving too much away if I talk about it? Anyways, they're going to be doing a really, really amazing article on water sports. And we're just going to leave it there. Okay. So for me personally, I am a swimmer. I used to be a lifeguard. I used to be a swim instructor. I love swimming. I'm in Florida. I got to know how to swim, right? A lot of my patients want to get back to the beach, want to get back to the pool. But even if I didn't live in Florida, swimming is just probably one of the most amazing sports I can think of um, for the human population in general, but especially folks who have physical disabilities. Okay. It's a wonderful way to do strengthening, um, very low impact, obviously on the joints. Um, so a lot of the challenges that I see for folks when they're trying to get back to the pool specifically is how do we get into and how do we get out of the pool? Okay, so we're going to kind of break it up just a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about that part first, right? Because I know uh, before we know it, summer season is going to be upon us. So as far as getting into the pool, usually what I tell my folks is go and scope out the pool first, right? Don't wear your bathing suit. Don't expect to go swimming. Just go to the pool that you are expecting to swim at and just look around and see what's going on. Personally, I love YMCA pools because there's a lot available there and they're everywhere. There's YMCA pools everywhere, right? And it's a reasonable rate to join. I like them because they always have a working chair, right? The chair that lowers into and out of the water. Many of them have the kind of pool that you can walk directly into. There's no steps or anything and they have a railing, which is really, really nice, especially if you want to wear your prosthesis inside the pool, okay? And I tell folks, go to the pool, check it out, right? Talk to the lifeguard, introduce yourself to the lifeguard or to the manager of the pool and just explain, hey, I have this physical disability. I have a prosthesis. I'm planning on getting into and out of the water, whether with or without the prosthesis. Do you think someone can help me figure this out? Right now, you have to be able to kind of be able to get yourself up and down that part. I don't know if the, life, the lifeguards are not going to be able to help you with that part, but they can certainly help you with accessing that chair. OK, and that's where you kind of start. Usually I think the anxiety for folks getting back to the pool and back to swimming is, you know, that initial like, well, where do I go? How do I maneuver this? Do I sit by the edge of the pool? Do I just jump in? What do I do? OK, so I would insist that you probably know how to get yourself up off the floor into your chair. Right. Unless you're going to be transferring into the chair that goes into the pool. OK, otherwise you can kind of sit down by the edge of the pool take your prosthesis off, leave it at the side of the pool, right? And get in the water, do your swim. You get back out, dry the light off, put your prosthesis on and off you go. Some of my folks choose to use crutches. They choose to leave their prosthetic leg in the locker room and then they come out on crutches, right? You need to decide what is gonna work best for you, what is gonna be safest for you. Some people might feel actually safer walking to the edge of the pool with their prosthesis versus using crutches on a wet deck, right? to get there, okay? But these are all things that I say, go take a visit first to the pool and just see what the scenario looks like. And so you can start kind of planning ahead. The next thing is, is when you do that first swim, guys, keep your expectations low, okay? Just acknowledge that it's gonna be your first time going into this new setting. You're gonna be troubleshooting. There's gonna be obstacles. You might make some mistakes. Keep your expectations low and try to go during a time when there's not going to be a lot of people there so that you can obviously be a little more comfortable in that setting. OK, when you're actually in the pool, right, I would say the majority of amputees that I know that enjoy swimming, they swim without their prosthesis. They just go in with their residual limb as is and off they go. And if you were swimming prior to your amputation, usually you start using the same techniques, right? You got to adjust things a little bit, right? And you have to, you won't have quite as much power with having only one leg kicking or maybe just uh, two residual limbs, but you'd be amazed at what you can do. There are pieces of equipment out there that can help with this. 
um, one of those things, and I should have brought it with me, it's in my kids' swim bags outside, is a pool buoy. Um, so that can go in between um, the residual limb and the sound leg, and it kind of helps keep your legs afloat to help out with that and help out with your balance as you're trying to figure out how to swim again. Um, the next thing that I really love to bring to the pool is a kickboard. And they're really cheap, guys. Kickboards can be like 10, maybe 15 bucks on Amazon, right? And they will last you forever, especially for those of you who are on a budget. It's a really simple piece of equipment that can really take you places, right? And with a kickboard, you can do exactly that. You grab on with your arms and you start practicing kicking, okay? And just trying to figure it out. So yes, ideally, if you can have someone who can give you a couple of swim lessons and a swim instructor, that would be great. And maybe they can only just have to give you one or two swim lessons. Um, and those of you who are on a budget that may not be able to have those swim lessons, you know, as long as you're being safe, right? Don't want anybody drowning or anything like that. Um, start with the kickboard. Start off super easy and so simple like that. Hey there, Van Gregory. Tex is in the house. Um, I know, Steve, that's hilarious. He says, I've always asked, do you one leggers go in circles when you swim? <laughs> And you should say, no, we, we swim in triangles. That's what you should tell them, Stephen. <laughs> um, Jill says, changed prosthetist at the suggestion of my surgeon. Sample leg picked up yesterday, suction versus lanyard. It's been almost a year since the amputation, and I'm hoping that this leg will work. Well, Jill, I really hope it works out for you. So correct, uh, clarify that for me, Jill. Are you using a lanyard now or are you using the suction? All right, let's see. We got, who else do we have some? Okay. Hey there, Kathy. Glad you could join us as well. All right. So here comes the next question. Anybody else out there like to swim? Guys, I like, I like hearing your swim hacks. I'm going to take a sip of my soda. I want you guys to tell me a little bit about how you get yourselves into and out of a pool. And what are some of your favorite hacks for swimming in a pool? Susan says, even after eight years, I just don't like people seeing my residual limb. And Susan, that's a very, um, that's a very normal thing. I hear that um, from some amputees that they feel like exposing their residual limb is the same thing like, you know, kind of walking around without their shirt on, right? They don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, some of my folks who feel like that, they will sometimes keep the liner on. Um, and they feel like they have just a little bit more privacy that way. Uh, some folks decide to construct a water leg. Okay, and that's another very popular option here, especially here in Florida. Um, and the easy way to do that is, well, not easy, but the best way to do that in a cost-effective way is to save an old socket, perhaps the socket that maybe you just finished using, as long as it wasn't completely tearing up your skin or causing a lot of issues with pain, as long as it's more or less functional, right? So using the old socket and then having um, a water foot. And there are several companies that make these water feet. Um, College Park is obviously the first one that comes to mind, Breeze Foot and the Sidekick Stubby Foot. Um, the Breeze Foot as well, especially, it's a very inexpensive foot to buy. So it's, it's not a huge expense. Um, so for those of you who want to keep your leg on, whether you're at the beach or at the pool, this is a very uh, cost-effective way to do this and not put the water abuse on your normal walking leg if it's not allowed to get wet. Right. Uh, let's see. Let's see, Richard says, got a new swim leg. Nice. And there's a company out there called Amphins. And guys, I just haven't had a chance to reach out to them, but I do kind of want to reach out to them and just kind of find out like how, you know, how they attach the fin and how it works. And um, I know some of you out there are snorkeling and scuba diving enthusiasts. So I'd be curious to hear your opinions on that. Uh, Steven says, crutches, crutch to the edge of the pool and dive in. All right. Uh, Richard says he loves to snorkel. Uh, Susan says, I put my entire leg, including prosthesis, into a water leg and I can just get in like everyone else. There you go. Uh, Kay says, I love to swim. I use a chair. By the side of the pool, I learned at the AMP conference last year that when doing the backstroke, it's only it's the only stroke to modify. You kick two straight and one across the midline. Keeps you going straight. Other than that, swim like you have two legs. Yes. And did you learn from Mavio? Okay. Is he the one who taught you? 
I am just dying. I'm a huge fan of Mabio. I can't wait to meet him. And I'm hoping to meet him at the, at the NPT conference this year. I hope he goes. Uh, Tom says, I have an awesome swimming leg with water foot and works great. Um, Kay says, I like my amp fins, especially when snorkeling. So that's kind of sometimes what I hear is like for snorkeling and scuba diving, people do like to use the fins. But when it comes to actual just like swimming, lane swimming in the pool, people tend to prefer to um, just go without anything and just use their residual limbs. Uh, then Gregory says, when I did go to the pool on the cruise, I would just walk to the poolside benches, took my prosthesis off, scooted to the pool on my butt and knuckles and got into the pool. There you go. Um, Pat says, as a right above the knee, I use my side stick crutches to go from the locker room out to the pool. Then I use the steps and railing to get into and out of the water. The neoprene suit helps too, feels very comfortable and freeing swimming without the prosthetic device. There you go. So fortunately have the pool, take prosthesis off, use my walker, hop to the edge, sit down, slide in and swim. Just add water, right? Oh, right, Kay? Yes. No, like I said, cannot wait to meet that guy in person. All right. So thank you guys for putting this all in there. I really love when I hear how you guys do it because obviously you have more experience at that. So thank you. Uh, let's see. This next question that came in says, I get really tight in my residual limb and lower back and hips. I've tried laying on the bed and letting my leg hang off. And this is an above the knee amputee, but I am double jointed. I have flexibility beyond the normal person. So that one is not really doing anything for me. Uh, do your workouts begin or end with stretching? Do you have a program that's just about stretching and kind of a yoga type class that I'm assuming might have flexibility? I'm above the knee amputee. Um, okay. So yeah, let me just, sorry. Um, so, okay. So for this person, first of all, this interesting, this person said, I'm I have tightness, but I'm double jointed. And I do hear that a lot. So I do kind of want to clarify that. Okay. So this is close to a little anatomy lesson we're going to be getting today. Right. So when you have, I don't even know what Bob is doing here. Do y'all, do y'all see this hot mess right here? That is Bob. I have no idea what just happened. That means my kids were here. It's now noticed it's very awkward positioning. Okay. So your bones are connected to each other, right? And they're connected with ligaments. That's how they are connected, right? So you have ligaments that hold the bones together, okay? Tendons are what are attached to your muscles, okay? So a lot of times people will get those two mixed up, right? A lot of people will think that tendon is ligament, ligament is tendon, okay? So from bone to bone, right, ligament. And I'm just gonna type that down because I'm a visual learner. I don't know about y'all. equals my anatomy professor would probably be rolling in his grave right now for seeing that. Okay. Then you have what attaches the muscle to bone. And that is called a tendon. Okay. So you have the muscle belly. That's like that red part of the muscle belly. Yeah. Not a very big muscle right now. Right. And then it ends into that little white part, the tendon and the tendon attaches it to the bone. Okay. When someone has tightness, right? We're talking about muscle contracture, muscle tightness. We're referring to the tendon, right? And sometimes even the muscle belly, usually it's the muscle, it's the tendon, right? So the tightness is in the tendon, meaning the part that connects the muscle to the bone. When someone talks about being double jointed, it's because they have ligament laxity, meaning that their ligaments are what's loose. What's connecting their bone to bone, that's what's loose, okay? So sometimes people can have ligament laxity, meaning the ligaments are loose, but tendon tightness, okay? Does that make sense, guys? I'm gonna repeat that one more time. So for example, we have a big old juicy ligament right here in our hip and it's called the Y ligament or the, the Y ligament of Bigelow. I don't know why they come up with these names. It's called a Y ligament because it looks like a Y shape when you see it on the anatomy, right? And it does a beautiful job of like connecting uh, your femur to your hip and just kind of holding it all together, right? And it kind of comes across like, I'm trying to imitate my fingers. Like it looks like a Y. You see how my two fingers are kind of in a Y shape, right? So that holds the hip joint together, right? 
Then you have the psoas muscle and that tendon goes over everything like this, okay? So for those of you who have hip tightness, most of the time, it's due to the fact that your psoas muscle is tight. The tendon of your psoas muscle is tight. Sometimes, sometimes the ligament inside can also get tight. Okay, so why am I like going through this really convoluted explanation? Okay. When folks come talking about having hip tightness, when they have back tightness, when they have any kind of tightness in the body, it's really important to distinguish what kind of tightness do they have, okay? Do they have ligament tightness or capsule tightness, sometimes we call it, right? Do they have tightness in their tendons, okay? And how we go about stretching that is determined by what we're finding, okay? So someone who tells me that they have tightness in their hip, right, but they are double jointed, I need to be really careful in the position that I'm placing them in to make sure that I'm not stretching out their ligaments even more because that can create, excuse me, a joint instability, right, okay? So a lot of times you guys have heard me in the past say, if you have joint tightness, if you have muscle tightness, if you have muscle contracture, really, really important to go see that physical therapist to really evaluate how tight that is, where the contracture is, because part of what they're doing is they're evaluating to see, is that coming from the ligaments? Is it coming from the tendon? Is it coming from both, right? And that will determine the best course of treatment, okay? If you have someone who has a lot of ligament laxity, you don't want to go cranking too much on that joint because you can make that joint unstable and you want to focus instead on strengthening around that joint to stabilize it as much as possible. Does that kind of make sense? I know this is kind of like a hoo 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 um, uh, explanation. So thumbs up. Did you guys kind of, yeah, no, let me know. I don't think I've ever talked about like the differences between ligament and tendon. So I think usually the first time I explain things for the first time, it's like, did I really explain that clearly or not? Eh. So Susan says, I have a nerve trapped under the tendon ligament in my hip and the pain numbness runs down the side of my leg. Okay. So that's a really good one. So actually, Susan, what's probably the culprit for you is the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve, it's about the size of your finger, which is actually, that's a pretty big size for a nerve, right? And it sits under a tiny little muscle called the piriformis muscle. It's a tiny little muscle. It's about the width of two of your fingers, right? So if you think about it, proportionally speaking, that nerve is huge, compared to the little tiny piriformis muscle it sits under, right? So sometimes what happens is if there's weakness, right, in the, in the gluteal area, in the bottom, right, if you have weakness in those muscles, the piriformis is trying to kind of compensate a little bit and it starts tightening and it starts tightening around that nerve, right? And it kind of does this, right? And that's what can send those shock waves down the side of your leg. Okay, so that's not necessarily due to tendon or ligament tightness. That's the actual muscle belly that is sitting around that nerve and cranking on it, right? So again, this is where the PT can come in and evaluate, is that in fact what is causing that nerve to fire off, okay? In which case, the therapist can either go in manually, right, just kind of find that piriformis and help release it, right, to kind of give a little bit of that pain relief and then strengthen the structures around it to prevent it from spasming again, okay? All right, good. Kind of made sense what I said? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Because <laughs> sometimes, I got to tell you guys, Mom before after a long day and it's nine o'clock at night and I'm sitting there going, am I making any sense? I don't know if I'm making any sense. And since I can't see y'all's faces to know if you're just like falling asleep or, you know, have a puzzled look on your faces, I can't tell sometimes. So thank you for the feedback. <laughs> okay. So yeah, bottom line. And yes, to answer that question, yes, I do have an entire flexibility section in here. Okay. It's actually the last section. Flexibility, there it is. So I have an entire section of flexibility in the back section of the book and also in the videos. Now the flexibility exercises that I have in here, they're very general, okay? I didn't put very specific, very uh, 
niche <laughs> flexibility exercises because those are ones that honestly your physical therapist needs to assign. But all of these exercises, these flexibility exercises are just a good general stretching program. And I teach you in this program how to position yourself safely so you're stretching the right structures and not overstretching or damaging something else. Okay. Um, so this is a really good foundational stretching program that's included in this book. So I use it myself. <laughs> Kay says, the bane of my existence, I sit on a tennis ball a lot. Let me explain that. <laughs> Some people are going to be like, why is she sitting on a tennis ball? Okay. So, you know, because the, the piriformis, like I said, it's a tiny, tiny little muscle, right? And it, you know, when it crunches up like that, it really just, just, you know, sends those shock waves. Uh, so sometimes, yes, you can have somebody sit on a tennis ball because it's just a small you know, it almost kind of mimics a person's knuckle, which is kind of what we use sometimes to, to relax that muscle. And you just kind of sit on it and it kind of just like, you know, gets that muscle to kind of relax a little bit. Um, there's also another stretching exercise that's in my book um, where you cross the knee over and you're really feeling that stretch back there in that piriformis area. But again, the key is why is that piriformis muscle spasming? Because there's usually some underlying weakness there, usually in the glute medius um, and in the glute maximus muscles. Okay, that's where the bridges come into play, and that kind of helps firm that area up and hopefully relieve some of that um, shock waves there. Okay, all right, guys, we had a lot of good questions tonight, so thank you. Um, as always, guys, let me go ahead and just put in. Okay. So that is my email right there, guys. For those of you who have questions and perhaps you're a little shy about putting it in the comment section, I am more than happy to answer your questions discreetly through the email section. That's you can email me right there. That's my email. I check all my emails and I answer within 48 hours. 48 hours. That's pretty easy. Yeah, I'm 48 hours. I haven't been able to keep up with that, right? Um, so please send me your questions. Don't be shy. That's what the show is all about. Next week, next week I have, ooh. Ronnie's coming on the show next week. Oh, I almost forgot. I can't believe I almost forgot. So Ronnie Dixon, he is the owner of Prosthetic and Orthotic Associates of Tennessee. He is no stranger to my show. He was on my show last year. I love having Ronnie on the show, guys. He is an amazing prosthetist. He's an above the knee amputee himself. He is a world-class rock climber, like certifiable world-class, like world championship, second place winner, rock climber, um, and just an amazing human being. And one of the reasons I love having him on the show is he's just very frank with his opinions. He has no problems sharing his opinions and his professional opinions on the do's and don'ts about being an amputee and everything involved with prosthetic, with rehabilitation, all the nine yards. So next week, we're going to actually be talking about bilateral amputees. I have never done a show just for my bilateral amputees. Now, those of you guys who are my unilateral amputees, I still expect you to be there next Wednesday, okay? Come show your support because there are a lot of things that you can learn from it as well, okay? So we're gonna be talking a lot. The whole show is gonna be about bilateral bilateral woo -hoo, amputees, okay? So guys, spread the word. Next Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Cozy Talks Facebook and YouTube channel. Start checking the e-blast because I'll be sending some more information there. Ronnie, oh, Tammy says Ronnie built her leg. Wonderful. Um, yes, Johnny, I am God willing going to be at the uh, Amputee Coalition Conference, National Conference this August in Orlando. I will be there with one of my favorite companies and I'll be sharing that a little bit later. Um, so Marianne says I will be, yep, yeah, Marianne, I, I expect you to be front row seat, darling. Uh, Richard says he's a BK and he will still be there. Guys, come join, come join. There's, there's always a lot to learn. And like I said, Ronnie, wealth of information, wealth of information there. All right, guys, as always, thank you for letting me be a part of your lives this evening. Um, I will see you next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. God bless.